when we look, start looking at this, I want to read two quotes from Mark Denvers. He's a Baptist preacher, but he has some good things to say. He did this in one, some of his books. Intercessory prayer is perhaps the most basic ministry of the elders. In order to speak to God for men, elders must speak to God for men. And then finally he stated, you as a church member either need to trust your leaders or replace them. But don't say that you acknowledge them and then don't not follow them. Rather than distrusting church leaders, let me encourage you to talk behind your elders' backs, meet in secret, and plot to encourage your leaders. Strategize to make the church leaders work, not partisan. So what's he saying? If you don't like your leaders, then you need to pray for them. If you need to meet behind their backs to talk about them, then talk about them with other people in ways that we can encourage them. How can we build them up? How can we pray for them? How can we make their work not burdensome? Now, as we look at church government, we go all the way back to Acts chapter 2, because what do we hear all the time in today's society? I want an Acts 2 church. Well, in Acts chapter 2, did the church have any form of government? Yay, nay. I mean, when it comes to the church in Acts chapter 2, were there any deacons? Were there any teachers? Were there any Sunday school teachers? Were there any pastors? No, there weren't. And all of those things make up what we know as church government. So there was no church government in the beginning in Acts 2. And just on a side note, I never went in Acts 2 church. There are a lot of good things we can glean from the early church, but they were a baby church. We've moved on. Not that we're better than them, but I'm all about standing on the shoulders of giants to see far. I've seen where they've come. They're saying that a wise man learns from his own mistakes. The wise man learn from the mistakes of others. You know what? I can learn about Acts 2 Church, but I don't want to live there. I want to go far beyond. I want my vision to exceed what they have. I want my faith to be more than the faith that Stephen had. I want to do more miracles than they did. Not that I'm being greedy, but man, they've done that, but man, I want to stand on their shoulders and I want to do more. I want to go far. But when we look at Acts chapter 2, there were no government. There weren't even any pastors. You had 120 people in an upper room gathering for the Holy Ghost to come. That is all the early church consisted of. And at that point, what we had were followers. Because technically, the leader, Jesus Christ, had ascended. Who was in charge of the early church at that point in Acts 2? Nobody. Jesus Christ was the head as he should be. But there weren't any pastors to say, okay, this is what we need to do. Okay, you're off your theology a little bit. Let's look at the Torah or the Old Testament scrolls, which to them they would have been the current scrolls, and let's see what the scriptures say. There was nothing like that. We have 120 people in the upper room waiting for the Holy Ghost. But yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, the Bible says, and God gave some governments. So when we look at that word government, it appears in four verses of the entire Bible. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah 9, 7, um, Isaiah 22, 21. So if someone will please read 9, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 is a familiar passage. And someone else gets 2 Peter 2, 10. 2 Peter 2, 10. So before we move on to 2 Peter, because we're living in a day and age where everything in the Bible is symbolic, he can't literally mean that. When he said that the government should be upon his shoulders in 96, did he mean physical government, or does that render something different, Brother Greg? That the government shall be upon his shoulders. I mean, first of all, who, are, who is this passage speaking of? It's referring to Jesus Christ. So, 
Are we just talking about a spiritual government? It doesn't physically exist, it's just kind of out there. Are we talking about they were referring to something symbolic and we have to dig a little bit deeper? No. They were referring to the actual governments of the world. Not something symbolic. We're not symbolizing anything. But in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we're talking about the physical government of the world. And the government shall be upon its shores. So what about 2 Peter 2.10? Okay, so here we have a list of people that are back talking and everything else. In this verse, are we talking about a spiritual government that's not physical? Or are we just symbolizing something? Or are we talking about a physical government? We're talking about the physical government of the world. So Isaiah 9, 6, physical government, the world government. 2 Peter 2, 10, those that despise the government. Those things, the literal government of the world. What's the government of the world? As we know it, it would be presidents, vice presidents, prime ministers, um, ambassadors, um, congressmen, congresswomen, the Senate, um, Congress. I know Congress and the Senate. I'm having a lapse. Represent, state representatives. We're talking about a physical, physical government. And if it only occurs in four verses of the Bible, and we really want to get down and study something, we actually go throughout the Word of God and see how was it used. Especially if we're looking at Greek words and Hebrew words. Unless you've done a lot, a lot of study and you're gone to the college, what's the one that usually the things we do? We sit down, we find that Hebrew word, we trace it throughout the Bible, and we go, oh, it was in you. We, it was used in this verse. So let's look to this verse and see how it was used. What's it referring to? Oh, it means this. That's the same thing as over there. So let's check it out a little bit farther. Was it used again? So we flip to another verse. Oh, it's used as the same way as it might be a different word, uh, English translation word, but it's still the same use. It means exactly this. So we narrow it down. So when we're looking at the word government, and we're looking at these verses, and it's not that many, we are seeing that it's referring to a physical government, not something just spiritual, not something made up, not something symbolic, but something that is physical. The English word government occurs in only one verse in the entire Bible. We've read that week after week after week. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has that some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, the gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And then when we start tracing the Greek word that was used to in place the Greek word that was translated to the current English word in our Bible, it's in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, that only occurs in one verse of the Bible. And if it only occurs in one verse of the Bible, guess where it's at? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28. So that's where we're at. So we're looking at a physical government, not something made up, not something just spiritual, not just something that symbolizes something, but we are looking at the physical government that God has given to the church. Now, when it comes to church, what do we think of title of who, let me back up, I'm, this is coming down a little funny. When we think of church government, what are some titles associated with church government? Deacons? Any other titles do we associate with governments? Pastor, that's a really big one. He's right there at the top. Deacon, so you have the pastor. If we're going to come down the chain of command, we have deacons. If we want to broaden it out a little bit, deacons could also be uh, called bishops. Bishops, they could also be called, we call them here, council members. Who else falls under the deacons when it comes to leadership? What's that? Not priests. Nope, we've already said pastors. We have pastors, we have deacons, bishops, council members, yada, 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 whatever you want to title them. Prophets. Teachers. 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 I would say teachers. In our modern church government, we would have teachers. If you had a prophet in your church, 
they kind of would fall along everybody else because, to be honest, if you have a true prophet or prophetess, how many people really like to hear what God wants to say to them? Especially if it's bad. I mean, not everything they say is bad, but they get their life is a little bit harder because the church doesn't like what they're saying, even if it's the truth. And if they're not willing to receive it, guess what they do to the prophet or prophetess? Right out the door. Or they make them uncomfortable until they just leave or God tells them, all right, they're not getting it, time to move on. So those are the typical things we think uh, when it comes to church government. Now, if we go back to the early church, their setup might have been a little bit different when it comes to church government. Really, if we study it out, you would have really, and today it would probably be kind of the same depending on where you're at and how the church views it, but I would really put apostles up there too. An apostle being one who founds churches and goes from place to place. We, Paul referred to himself as an apostle. He went from place to place founding churches. And we also see him keeping in contact with those churches. And if something wasn't right, off goes a letter. I encourage you in Jesus Christ, but you need to fix this. And probably one of the most famous ones we think of is the church at Corinth, because there's two books telling them, you need to get right. You need to fix this. Or at least, at least one book telling you you need to fix this, and uh, book two telling them, okay, this is what you've done good, and you've done good for correct. And then you would have the pastor, and who knows how, I'm not sure how else it would have been laid out. But the reason I say that with the apostles, when you look at the life of Timothy, it almost seems like he wasn't just at one church, but kind of he was over an overseer of an area, which, depending on your denomination, the larger denominations, uh, you United kind of Pentecostal churches, the assemblies, you'd have those district uh, supervisors and stuff like that kind of overseeing. Now, if we go back to Acts 2, we have none of this. Is it all right that we have governments today like this? Why, absolutely, Brother Justin. That is absolutely right. And the reason being is, as the old Chinese proverb goes, many hands make light work. And we see the need of this in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Someone will please read that. Acts 6, 1 through 7. So let's go back a little bit. We're going to go back to the Acts 2 church that everybody loves. So what happened in Acts chapter 2? Just going through them real quick. I'll do the summary. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, we have the Pentecostal passage. And we have the descending of the Holy Ghost from the church like a mighty rushing wind. Throughout the rest of the chapter, what happens? The church grows. The church grows. How many, do you not remember roughly how many people the church grew by? 5,000. 5, I can't remember exact numbers if it was 5, 3, but a lot of people. Who's the pastor in Acts chapter 2? There is no. So now we have 120 in the upper room. And we're adding 3 or 5,000. Okay. Guess what happens, let's just say, the following day? Peter and John, they're going to the temple, and what happens? 
there's who's being lazy by the gate? Not really being lazy, but Amen. exactly. That's what I was trying to get at. And what happens to the lame man? I'm already walking, brother, but I'll take the silver and the gold. <laughs> but there's something else that happens after that. So what happens to the lame man? He's not just at the gate anymore, but where is he? Where is he leaving and jumping at? At the temple. And what happens at the temple as he's leaping and jumping and everything else? Oh, we remember that part, but what happens before that? Peter started preaching. And what happens after Peter starts preaching again? Okay, we're going to do this step by step. Okay, Peter's out there preaching. Now the people come in. Now what happens? Well, how do the people respond? Are they gripped in their hearts with the message they heard? And do they just stay pricked in their hearts? Do they make their hearts hard? What happened? 5,000 people get saved. So, in Acts chapter 2, we have 3 or 5,000 get saved. I don't remember exactly because I'm going off the cuff and I can go over this. It was 3,000 at first and then it was 5,000. I think you're right. But the thing is, the Bible mentions 5,000 particular gender men. If we start breaking things down, they guesstimate that roughly 13,000 people got saved from the temple of Count alone. So we have 3,000. We have 120 in the upper room. Now we have 3,000 at it. Now we have another 13,000. Who's the pastor? Nobody. Nobody. But in Acts chapter 6 that Brother Craig just read, there's something interesting. How many, we find that the people were murmuring in verse 1. How many people came to address the people? So keep in mind, we have about 13,000. Let's go down to conservative. 12,000, another three, 15,000. 15,000, 120. So 15,000, 120 people. How many pastors? How many people came together to address the murmurings and the complainings? Twelve disciples. So we have 13,000 people and 12 disciples. Does it mention any other people coming further? We don't have any mention of bishops, deacons. We don't have any assistants coming to help. We have 12 men in charge, which means that there were probably 12 overseers or 12 pastors at the time. But as we stated earlier, many hands made light work. The disciples came into a problem. There was more people that they could keep up with. They needed help. So we have the creation of what I can see to be the very first church office really being reported besides whether it be an overseer or apostle, whatever you want to classify them as. We have the creation of the office of deacon, bishop, council member, whatever you want to call it. And when we look at that office, did it arise just because somebody wanted a title? No. No. It arose because there was a need. Why do we have different offices throughout the church? Because not one person can do absolutely everything. With secular jobs, they may try to make you work and do everything, but... In reality, one person can't do everything. And thus, we have the creation of the church government. And God knew in his infinite wisdom that the church was going to grow. She couldn't stay by herself. That there were no, It wasn't going to be able to be just 12 apostles or 12 pastors, whatever they viewed themselves as a secret time, overseers. It couldn't stay that way. If the church of Christ was going to grow, when I say church of Christ, I don't mean Latter-day Saints. But if the church of Christ were to grow, there's no way that one man can do everything. 
So there's going to be a need for other positions and other offices. And so today, not that it's a bad thing, but that's why we have the pastor. That's why we have apostles. Well, let me go back and go in order. That's why we have apostles. That's why we have pastors. That's why we have council members. That's why we have church um, Sunday school teachers. That's why we have children's church teachers. That's why we don't have just one Sunday school teacher. Because not everyone's going to be able to learn at the adult level. And let's face it, as adults, we don't constantly want to be hearing about Noah and his boat all the time. When it comes, well, even using the words of the Apostle Paul, do you want to have milk all the time? I mean, that's great if you're an infant. You have to be nourished and go through your stages. But do you really want to say just drink your milk and that's where you get your nurture from all the time? No. We've had ice cream. We've had steak. We've had eggs. For some of us, we've had bacon. I mean, and the list goes on and on. There's a plethora of food. In fact, chefs, they really, really like food because you have to be able to cook absolutely everything you, or you have to like everything you cook. That's why some of them aren't exactly uh, bodybuilders, for a lack of a better term. But the church needs people, and it needs to have individualized, individualized people for special needs. Because not one person can do everything, and not everybody can go on the same level all the time. It's one thing if we have, we all come to uh, kids who say that we love it. But if all we do is ever come to church and have kids who say it all the time, where are we growing uh, spiritually? We have to have something deeper. For me personally, there are books that when I'm studying a topic, man, they're absolutely wonderful. But I find as the more I study the topic, man, that book is shallow. If I have to go back and reread that book, man, that ha book has a special place in my heart, Brother Craig, because that's what got me started on really understanding the topic. But man, if I had to go back, Brother, and, and read that book over and over to glean from it and pull from it, there's no way it's happening. It just isn't. I, I am so far beyond that book just with my head knowledge and my heart knowledge, I can't stay in that book. But God's taking me farther and deeper, and we are all the same, and that's why we have a church government. Because there are special needs that be addressed, and not everyone has the same talent either. That's why others have some gifts, and others have different gifts. What did the Apostle Paul say concerning to the church and the gifts? When it comes especially to the gifts of the Spirit, he talked about the body. Not everybody can be the head, but not everybody can be the foot, too. Not everybody can be the pastor. Not can everybody be the maintenance person either. Uh, uh, Ephesians 4, uh, 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, that the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is exactly, brother, why the gifts are given. That's exactly why we're talking about it. And if we would all stay on the same level or that somebody would teach to everybody the same thing, we would all be edified. We would all be uh, perfected into that. We wouldn't <coughs> even have the same head knowledge. So, that's why, that's why the Bible said everything has to be done decently and in order. Decently and in order. And there are a lot of people out there that seek titles. But really, when it comes to the calling and the gifts of God to the individual, it shouldn't be about the title. It really shouldn't be. It should be exactly what you read, brother, Steve, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Really, that's why the gifts are given. We have people that have made a show of the church and the gifts throughout the years, and throughout the decades. That's not why the gifts are given. They are given to edify the body. To the perfecting of the saints. I don't want to stay where I am. Me and Brother Steve were talking earlier. I am a firm believer that yes, we're not looking for the hole in the ground. We're looking for the hole in the sky. We are looking for the rapture. But man, there came a point in Elijah's life. There came a point in Enoch's life where God said, you know what? Why don't we just come on home? What was that? No man can see God and live. So they received their glorified bodies. I am a firm believer that even today's day and age, 
that we're living in, that an individual could get so close to God if they so choose, that God could say, you know what? I'm not going to wait for the rapture. Today, I am bringing you home with me. And what is that? That is that individual being perfected. That is that individual being edified. And how does he do that? Partly by the gifts that God has been given. Yes, through the teaching, through the gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation, but also because of the leadership. When it comes down to the church government and leadership, that is exactly our goal. If you go down through every single church's mission statement, it should be exactly that. For the, to some degree or in some wording, for the edification of the saints, that should be our goal. For the work of the ministry, that should be our goal. And I'm forgetting the other one off the top of my head. And for the perfecting of the saints. And when I say the work of the ministry, I would also tag right in there, evangelism comes right in there with that. Because really, that's what we're all about. Perfecting the saints. Trying to get everybody to heaven the best that we can. Guide them there. Evangelize the lost. Go out and tell them that they are lost and going to a sinner's hell. And that there's the reality of heaven. And when I say tell them that the lost are going to hell, I don't mean, you're going to hell! There's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. But that is our goal. That is the mission of the church. Not to leave anyone in the same stagnant state. Not to have us just come and sit on our pew. And not to hope that when we get to heaven that and expect that when God pulls down the book of life off the shelf or opens it, that he's going to reach and grab the church attendance book right next to us and say, well, you know what? You didn't live right. I saw you cursed here. You stole here. But you went to church every Sunday. That's not what this is all about. That's not what the church government is about. When we talk in church government, the reason that it came into existence is it's a gift of God for the ministry, for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, and for the edifying of the believer. And the reason for that is because one person can't do every job. We don't God, do this for our title. And God puts in the opposite who he wants He does. Not who they want, who they want to go. Because not everyone is fit for some opposite. No. But on a side note, as we're closing, I would throw in a special clause in there, brother. If the church isn't doing what God wants them to do, if they're not living right, God might give them what they want to bring about His will. So, but... When it comes to church government, so there's always, but when it comes down to it, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Just as God is the one who raises up and puts down kings, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, as wicked and evil as he was, God put him in office. God put him in his position to bring Israel to the place that they need to be to turn back to him. And they lost a lot of things in the meantime. But God is the one that places men and women where he wants them to be for his time their purpose, and to steal from the book of Esther for such a time as this, well, they are there. Any thoughts, any questions, anything anybody wants to ask? If not, we'll talk about the office of deacon a little bit more next week before we move on. Let us bow our heads in prayer, though, we prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires, Lord. Anoint our minds to remember what you talk to us and said to us throughout the week, Lord, and what you've spoken to our hearts, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you anoint our hearts that they would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would be farther transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. Anoint the pastor at his mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, and give him a special blessing. Anoint the song leaders, give them a special blessing as they lead us in the song that you have to sing. As they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. I pray everything that is said and done here, that you would receive all glory and honor, and that it would magnify you in all faith, that it would not be a disgrace to you, Lord.
May we be your hands extended. But Lord, may all who come behind us find us faithful, Lord. Say that they did the work of the ministry for the task that God has appointed them for. And we'll ask all these things and give you praise and glory for it. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus.